artifacts. What, what are they or what parts of the body do they involve? They surely involve the brain, the central nervous system. They involve the autonomic nervous system, which comes from the brain and then travels through nerves throughout the body to control the vital functions of the body, body temperature, pulse rate, breathing rate, etc. The immune system, they, inf they affect energy metabolism and the mitochondria, which are the little organelles inside every cell that make energy for the cell. There are genetic studies that show genetic differences that I'll summarize. And then finally, there is the link between infectious agents and this illness. So turning first to the brain. Now I think it has been well established by many studies. Maybe I should preface, because um, I'm going to say well established by many studies a lot of times in the next few minutes. What do I mean by that? Well, what I don't mean is that every single study in the literature all comes to the same conclusion. I mean there are some differences in the literature on this question, as there are on nearly every question in medicine. You know, should women age 40 to 50 have mammograms every year? Is there a difference of opinion on that? You bet there is, and there are hundreds of other controversies like that. But when I say it's been established, I mean that if you look at all of the studies that have been published and ask yourself, where is the preponderance of evidence? Do most of the studies with most of the patients come to the conclusion that there is an abnormality or not? The answer is overwhelmingly yes. The neuroendocrine system, the part of the brain that controls the glands elsewhere in the body that make hormones, is affected. Thinking is affected. The autonomic nervous system is affected. Studies that use MRI scans, which are a way of looking inside at the anatomy of the brain, uh, show abnormalities. Another scanning technique for looking at the brain, SPECT scanning, shows abnormalities. And although there are fewer studies, uh, there are several, that, including one that I'll talk about briefly that we're just now readying for publication ourselves, that show that brain waves or EEG uh, abnormalities are found in this illness. So lots of different uh, evidence using different techniques for looking at the brain that show there are differences. Having said this, none of them show a brain condition that is permanent or keeps getting worse. They show abnormalities typically that come and go, which is very much like the waxing and waning of the symptoms of this illness. So I'm not talking about brain conditions that are permanent or progressively downhill. I'm talking about abnormalities in the brain that come and go, but that clearly distinguish patients with CFS from healthy people, from people with depression, from people with other uh, fatiguing illnesses. Here is one of them. The details don't matter, but this is a study of the spinal fluid. When a spinal tap is done, the fluid that bathes the brain, that reflects what is happening inside the brain, is obtained. And you can measure what's in the spinal fluid. If you're looking for proteins, the very best technique known to science is mass spectroscopy. And using that technique, a whole group of proteins in the brain were found in a third to a half of patients with chronic fatigue syndrome versus none of patients who were healthy. Highly significant uh, differences statistically. And what those molecules and others that I haven't shown you for lack of space say is that there is a low-grade inflammation going on in the brain. There is something in the brain that the immune system doesn't like, doesn't want to be there, but wants to get rid of. And that's being reflected in these proteins in the spinal fluid. 
Here's another test of spinal fluid, again using the gold standard that no scientist would dispute, which is a measurement of lactic acid in the spinal fluid. Here are groups of patients with anxiety, here are groups of patients who are healthy, and here are the levels in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. Double or triple the levels uh, in the other two comparison groups. What causes lactate to build up in any fluid, but in this case in the spinal fluid, it is something wrong with energy metabolism in the cells of the brain. Next slide. Here is the brainwave study, the EEG study that I mentioned a minute ago. There are many different ways to look at brainwaves. Probably the most sophisticated, because it requires <laughs> intensive computer algorithms, is called spectral coherence. And very hard to explain what this technique does, but basically what it measures is a disorder in the brain between parts of the brain communicating with one another. In healthy people, you can show that a neuron over here is fired at the same time as a neuron over here. But that's coherent firing. But when you see uh, an incoherence between when one neuron fires and another one that should be firing at the same time but isn't, when you see that incoherence, you have a pattern of spectral coherence that's distinctive, that's like a fingerprint of the electrical activity in the brain. Using that technique, uh, as we are about to submit for publication, we have shown that patients with CFS can be diagnosed accurately with nearly 90% accuracy. Uh, when they are not taking medications. Interestingly, when they are taking medications, we asked everyone if they could possibly do so to get off any medicines that affected the brain. And some people, a minority, said, I just can't do it because I know, I've done it before, I've tried to go off that medicine, I'm going to feel terrible immediately afterwards. So they stayed medicated. And the technique did not as accurately uh, identify them, but one possibility is because what the medication was doing was improving this incoherence in a way that was making it closer to normal and certainly they were feeling better. It accurately classified people who were healthy controls. It accurately, with perfect accuracy, uh, classified people who were depressed. So it's a technique that could be used to help in the diagnosis but it, that, I think, needs to be tested by other laboratories and other groups of patients before it becomes recommended as a diagnostic test. Here's another study, again, just published within the last six months, that is uh, really pretty dramatic for any of you who experienced what I talked about earlier, which was post-exertional malaise. One of the distinguishing features of chronic fatigue syndrome is that people with this illness, who by and large perceived themselves as very physically vigorous in the years before they became ill, more vigorous, more athletic than most of their peers. Since then, mild exercise, raking the leaves on an autumn afternoon for 15 minutes or walking a few blocks, may actually feel exhilarating while they're doing it, but within 12 to 24 hours, there's a price to be paid. It's like a truck hit him. That post-exertional malaise is very characteristic of this illness, but we haven't really been able to explain why, why that was or to find any objective evidence that there was something different following exercise in people with this illness. Alan Light and his group at the University of Utah said, well, if exercise is affecting fatigue levels and pain levels, then let's look at the molecules that we know are involved in sensing pain and sensing fatigue in humans and in animals. And these molecules can be measured in the blood. 
before exercise and several time points after exercise. Next slide. So these are the 